Good morning. Uh, it was snowing when I left, but dried up as I got out of Chicago. It was dry all the way until I got to South Bend. So um, now it's even snowing more. So we're used to snow. Today is going to be Second Thessalonians lesson number 31. Uh, you can see that Deb's not here today. She's under the weather a little bit. Um, I thought we had the kitchen finished, but she got up the other day and she wants the colors and the, some of the walls a different color. I guess what she originally wanted. So green for one wall, this beautiful type of green with blue, and then off white for the other ones, which she felt she felt kind of from the men kind of burdened to do, do the, the whole thing green because it's a great color. But I wanted to get it done done the way she wants it. So maybe you know that'll happen Monday. Uh, but other than that, we're we're pretty much finished. Um, what else? I'm sure we're going to have to take down the tables today. Um, got a long, my, on, her, on my wife's phone, got a long thing from Dawn explaining all the procedures and names of things that was done to her that I can't remember. Replace, but it was like on, on my wife's phone, it was going down and down. And um, when she sent that, she was still having problems with, with water retention. No, you know, uh, I found out this morning that, that that's being, been taken care of. She had three liters of water removed per day for, for three days, three, three liters of water each day. And that one thing, water pill didn't work, but she has one, okay. And I know, after talking with my daughter, that this kind of an operation, it, it's... Her, her body's not used to it. It's so hard. It's to get, you know. She, one of the things I read, she had the, her coronary artery going right through her heart. And the things that this guy did, it was it's unreal. So her pump her, is working so hard now, and it's in this side it needs to catch up. And the, one of the things that happens is they they have lung problems. So um, they put her back in ICU, and she's. I guess she's doing bad to, better today, according to mom and dad, you know. So um, I'm thankful. Well, miss her laugh, and uh, and she loves the Lord. She loves this assembly, and and we love her. Um, I want you to go to Colossians chapter two. I just want to, um, from what Sam. I want you to read something to Sam, but I think I told you about this before. In, in answering the phones, there was some guy that called, and it was obvious that he had gone to our website, he has heard our preaching, he knows we use a lot of verses and all that, and he called up and he said, what's the mystery of God? I said, well, there can be there's many aspects to that, and he faces. Well, what is the mystery of God? And I said, I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. He says, well, go to Revelation 10, 7, which says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angels, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Then he went, ha, 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 I know more than you guys, and just hung up. I'm thinking... Do you know how ignorant that guy is? So when, when Sam did Colossians 2, I want you to write down three verses by Colossians 2. Revelation 10, 7, that's what verse I was just at, has to do with prophecy. Get the prophetic program. Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. It's the mystery of the Father. It says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Then in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in all one things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. That's the mystery of the Father. You got the mystery of God in Revelation 10. You got the mystery of, of the Father. Because in Colossians 2 2, it talks about the, the mystery of God and the Father and the, and the Christ. Third mystery is Ephesians 3, 4, which is the mystery of Christ in the dispensation of grace. 
Paul says, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, for that guy to pull something like that, it shows a, a high degree of, he, he's, not, he's not an adult. He wants to, you know, know something. He wants to pound his chest. And that's what people do who don't, under, don't write the divide. They, they, they go back to legalism. Or look at what I can do. See, I was talking about it. It's nothing of us. It's him doing the work in us that, that we can't take any credit in our flesh if we allow him to work in us. Know this. Reckon it to be true, then yield to that. And um, anyway, let's just have a word of prayer. Thank, thank you, Father, for, for your words and this, the clarification that we can um, understand your Bible dispensationally is what just clarifies it all, distinguishes it all. And I just pray that we keep our, our minds and our tempers when dealing with people like that so possibly they can get past the issue of salvation and start to grow like you want. Amen. So last week we have been studying tithing in connection with the nation of Israel and how this information connects with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Tithing was for a certain nation, some of this is, is repeat now, not Gentiles. Today in the dispensation of grace, God loved with a cheerful giver, no stipulated amount. We also saw God identifying his people as a seed in Nehemiah 11.1, 1. tied the tenth part when they came back from the 70 years expulsion from their land to dwell in Jerusalem. This tenth part is a type, a foreview of God preserving his godly seed. Remember, it's not just a seed. It's got to be godly seed because you can be a seed of Abraham or a Jew, but if you're not godly, you're not getting there preserving his godly seed into their promised land, which ties into their prophetic last days. Israel's last days are the most written about topic in the Bible. Because you've heard me say, what you see over here is a dress rehearsal, what's going to go on over here. Okay? And, all right. The tithing system begins and began in Genesis 14. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. This name in the Hebrew, the word God here, is El Elyon, means Most High Possessor of Heaven and Earth. Okay? So we have there in, Me in Genesis 14, you have Melchizedek is the king of Salem. He is the priest of the Most High God. He is a king priest, four. He is a king of righteousness, five. He is a king of peace, Hebrews 7, 2 says. Six, that is God's order. It's always righteousness and then peace. And seven, Salem is the city of Jerusalem later on. So Hebrews 7, 2 says, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. So you see here, Jeru, Shalom, meaning Jehovah, peace. In the El in the Elyon. In the midst of all this typology, this is a picture of the coming of the kingdom of glory of the Messiah, who will sit as a priest upon the throne, his throne. Tithing has to do with Israel. Now, if you're not Israel, it has nothing to do with you. I'm saying that to the camera. Don't get, don't get hornswoggled in. Tithing was for the nation of Israel. Today, in the dispensation of grace, there's no stipulated amount. There's not 10%, 20%, 23%, 33%. It's God love of the cheerful giver. You give out of the abundance of your heart. And we know why people do that, too, because they're, they're confused. The guy that made the, that call to me, I just thought, oh, Man, he, he's, he sounds like an adult, but, you know, I mean, what, what can you do? You know, and we, Sam talked about getting angry. I've, had, I've been angry before, too, and, uh, you know, and times I shouldn't have been. But you try. Um, why 10%? 10 is a Gentile number in the Bible. It means means talking about the nations. It is a complete number. An ordinal completion, the number designating place in an ordered sequence. Now, 
You have to figure that one out for yourself. I'm not, you know, but it's, it's something to do in, in an ordered sequence. It is a number of government completion. But God did not use the number 10 for the nation of Israel. He used the number 12. Now, we have the metric system over there in Europe, and I think we're the only country that is 12 inches to a foot. You know, it's, you know, with Israel, the numbers are 7 and 12. Okay? So why would God take the number 10 and say, I want a tenth of everything instead of saying I want a twelfth? That makes you that make makes more sense regarding supporting a government. When you begin to study the tithe in scripture, you find out it's not just the system of financing the government of Israel. It is also connected regarding the percentage issue with some things in prophecy. It is where God is looking out toward the end of the nation Israel and how he is going to reconstitute that nation and his kingdom centered in Jerusalem when the real king priest reigns and the priest sits on his throne. Now, this isn't on your outline, but as I was doing this, I decided to add this. Sometimes, you know how there's a dispute over in the Middle East about who owns the land and all that? And from Genesis 16, 12, that they're, they're a perpetual enemy of people over there? There are certain verses in the Bible, that single verses, that if you have your final authority issue settled, it's going to help you a lot. Numbers 33, 53, let me read it. It says, And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land, and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. That's a hardcore verse. He doesn't say he gave it to Ishmael. He says he gave it to Isaac. Deuteronomy 6.23 is the theme verse of Deuteronomy. You've got to understand that Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swear unto our fathers. Do we have any part of that land? No. How about the people in Israel? At this moment, do they have any part of that land? God's dealing with, with not with Jew and Gentile today, he's dealing with lost and saved. And Israel should get saved, you know, just like any other Gentile. Deuteronomy 6.25 says, now why don't you go to Exodus 15. Deuteronomy 6.25 says, now listen to this. I just read you 6.23. He brought us out from this and he might bring us in to give us the land. 25 says, and it shall be our righteousness. Now think of what Sam, what Sam just preached. It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he had commanded us. How many think you are righteous in, any, in things you do? If you obeyed the law, could you say it's our righteousness? What's the biggest problem we find out with Israel and mankind in general? Who can keep the law? Who can't keep the law? Even Israel, right? That's the biggest thing you find out. And if you know that, just that knowledge alone would, would take your understanding of the Bible and just mushroom it as you, as you read through it. Now, that was, this is Deuteronomy. Let me go right back to Exodus chapter um, let's see, 19. We, we've gone through this before. Moses is there, and he calls the elders of the people, and, and, and you know, and Moses, in verse 7, verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. He's talking to Moses. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together, 
and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the Lord to the people. No. Did they do them? Could they do them perfectly? Who is the only person to fulfill the law purposely, perfectly? Jesus Christ. Now, that's the simplicity of it all right there. And way back in the Exodus, you got the Ten Commandments on the next page. How many of the commandments have you broken? I don't want to hear any confessions. We're not Catholic here. But just think about it. He, 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 as, as our knowledge grows, what should be our attitude? I'm going to call, I'm going to call up, this guy doesn't know this verse, you know, uh, he, what's the subject, the mystery of God, what has to do with prophecy? He doesn't know what he's talking about. What's our attitude that we should have when learning more? It's, I think it's called humbleness, because you realize the depth that it could go to, you don't even realize how deep it can go, about those roots Sam was talking about. There's, there's no, it goes on forever. But humbleness and meekness and, you know, joy and patience and all those things, that should be the result of understanding this, plus the fact that anything we do in our flesh doesn't go up to God as that we did it, goes up to God that Christ in us and it came out of us only because of God, of Christ. And that takes, that takes just that there, would, would, if they understood it, would ruin most of the preaching in Christianity today that doesn't rightly divide. And I'm not angry, I'm just excited. What you learn about Israel is that they couldn't keep the Lord's covenant. They couldn't keep the law. Go to Romans 8, chapter 7. Paul comes along and he kind of explains it. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. It says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, but is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. He explains the, about carnal minds, then he really explains it, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, and verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, of a con good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. Does it mention anything fleshly that we do for the Lord? Or I built him a building, or I, you know, this and that. You know, I mean, all these things. You know, I'm so holy, I prayed for two hours. Don't touch me, because I'm you know, pure. What's happened to an Indian friend of mine who went into a guy's house, and he was up in the bedroom praying for two or three hours. And they had Second Timothy right on a wall up there, you know, 215. And then he comes down and he couldn't touch him. There's other guys there. He, no, he was too pure. You know, I wanted to go like this, you know. And, you know, more than once, maybe with this. And the point is, you can't touch me. I'm pure. So he thought, like his wife, used to pray in a closet so God can hear her more. Okay, it's, it's just, that's mankind. That's flesh. And that's wrong thinking. And how does humbleness come from that? I just prayed for three hours. Gene, you keep your distance because I'm clean. And you're not. When I took that away from the Catholic Church, uh, you know, like that, I thought I was clean. You know, and then, but I had to go back the next Saturday for confession. I mean, it's a rat race is what it is. This is the right purpose of the law. Micah 6, 8 says, And what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Matthew 23, 23 says, What want you, scribes and Pharisees? Ye have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. So it goes, it goes on and on like that. And it's... Uh, when you learn how to write and divide, these things become apparent. Um, Debbie, was, we were talking about, we were saved and spent two years in a church that rightly divided. 
And when you look back, we 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 did learn a lot because our, our routine changed at home. We read Hal Lindsey. We started looking to the people on TV and all that, and, and start, starting to learn. Well, that's not right. You know, that's, you know, you know, this way. And we started that, and we learned a lot. But so back to what I just read. So what ultimately happens? What ultimately happens that is pictured in Melchizedek and Abraham will ultimately be accomplished in Christ when he brings Israel back into the land. That's in that second paragraph there. Now, Nehemiah 11, 1 and 2. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, and the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. God is going to repopulate Jerusalem with his people. He's going to tie the tenth. The way he is going to do it is to take out, take out of all the tribes, <coughs> excuse me, take out of all the tribes of Israel, one, from all the people of Israel, he will take a tenth part of them in Jerusalem to repopulate it. Three, so when he's going to repopulate his city, he will use a tenth part. Four, God is going to tithe back to the nation a tenth of itself. God doesn't simply tithe money, but he also tithes people. And I want you to go with me. I'll just read this. Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra is the book of of the regathering of Israel and rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah is a book of rebuilding Israel and the city of Jerusalem. These things fit together as a unit. In fact, in a Hebrew Bible, it's only one book. They're a unit. Ezra, that's after coming back. Let me read, read the note I have down there. Ezra and Nehemiah were written to explain the Jews coming back to their homeland after being expelled for 70 years. This has given rise to many false doctrines, one of which suggests that not all Jews came back after the captivity, but some went to different, different places, such as England. Remember, I mean, this is way back then. I remember people talking about that. Not all the Jews came back. This tribe went, went up north or this or that, you know. People today do this because they want to be Jews. They want to be God's people, they want Israel's blessings, not understanding the full picture that with these blessings also came the prophesied curses for disobedience. Nehemiah 11.1 1 is proof that this idea is false if you have a final authority. Representatives from every tribe came. If not, God could not have written this because he doesn't lie. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Just that one verse proves that. Now, in Exodus 16, go back to Exodus 16. I have to read you the verses here. Is another one of these odd references to the tenth part dealing with the manna. Let me read you Exodus 16, verses 31 and 32. Exodus 16, 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. So here is the bread that sustained them through the wilderness. And I want you to take an omer of it and put it in the pot. Verse 33. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. This is going to be a memorial of God's provision to preserve his people through the wilderness. 
We saw that being done back in the Old Testament. Let me read verse 34 and 35. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. It's the first, the first and only time the word testimony is capitalized. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna, I'm sorry, until they came under the borders of, of the land of Canaan. Now, an Omer is a tenth part of an ephah. Okay. I reminded you last week that when they came to the land of Canaan, the manna ceased, and they began to eat the old corn of the land. Remember that? So, number one. The manna is over. That's the bread from heaven. The need for the special provision to get them through the wilderness is over. Three. Now they eat the riches of the Gentiles. Again, a picture of their coming kingdom. Now I say this to you in the context again, this context again. We are looking at the preservation of Israel through the wilderness, ending when they go into the land, what is typically a picture of the blessings of their kingdom. This same kind of context we found we find in Genesis 14 with Melchizedek, okay? Where you see a remnant of Israel is delivered. Two, you see the king priest, Melchizedek, and all this typology and the tithe introduced. Three, here is the tithe again. Exodus 66, there's 66. Now, an omer is a tenth part of an ephah. When he said, put that omer in the little pot, and put it in the ark, they were putting a tithe, a tenth part of the manna, in the ark. So really, they were tithing the manna into the ark. The manna represents something important. It is a memorial. It is, an, it is as important as the Ten Commandments that Moses put in the ark, the testimony, the tablet. Two, he puts Aaron's rod that budded in the ark. It is the type of the resurrection of Christ and of Israel. I've talked about everlasting life about Israel last week. Three, then he puts the manna which sustains them. This is in the ark. There is some tremendous, wonderful typology here. But when he puts the manna in, it is a tithe. It's a tenth of the manna. As we have talked about before, there are a number of chapters, whole chapters, that recount the history of the nation of Israel. You will never be able to understand the Bible if you don't understand the nation of Israel. I heard Richard Jordan say that many times he learned from Pastor J.C. O'Hare when he was, you know, they were, they were alive back in the 20s and 30s like that, you know. Um, you will never be able to stand, understand your Bible if you don't understand Israel. Now that guy that called up about Revelation ten seven, you know, the spirit of prophecy, ha ha, you don't know that, I know something that you don't know. Again, it's those kind of people. Why, why doesn't he read, he reads the first chapter, it's John writing this down. It's the subject of prophecy, not the mystery. Is there more than one mystery in the Bible? Well, sure there is, there are. But the dispensation of grace, God talks about grace in different, different times, but the dispensation of grace is exclusive, Romans through Philemon. And that's been going on for the last 200 years. And if you don't understand Israel, that's why I'm going back over here. I want you to understand Israel better so you can have um, scriptural guns, not, I shouldn't say guns, but ammunition to fight with people you know, in a nice way. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we're dedicated. We're, we're, we, we understand this. And I, I guess I, when we talk, it's maybe we just maybe over talk or say things too fast to people. You know, and I've, I've learned to say, well, just go back and read the content. You know, I've, I've learned. But sometimes you have to be that way with people. That won't give you an edge to talk. You want to get in a verse or two here or there. And just, why don't you go look at this verse? It might clear it up. This guy had no clue about what's going on in the Bible. He's one of those guys that takes a look at that and those things. Oh, they're coming on us right now. And he's not giving people any comfort. 
because he thinks he's a, a scholar, okay? This is why you will find at least six to seven different places in the scripture, whole chapters that recount Israel's history, and each one of them recounts it in a very special, in very special terms with special emphasis. For example, Psalms 105 and Psalms 106 recount Israel's history, but from different perspectives. Psalm 78 and Psalm 74 are two of those Psalms, okay? I want you to go to um, Psalm 78. Just for clarification, Psalms is divided into five sections, and I want you to think of 2 Thessalonians 1, that tell Israel how God is going to deliver them through the Davidic covenant. David wrote most of the Psalms, right? Section 1, he comes as Israel's redeemer. These are the sections in Psalms. Section 2, he comes as Israel's deliverer. And I told you to think of 2 Thessalonians 1. Do you think the third section is what 2 Thessalonians 1 is talking about? He comes as Israel's avenger. Is any talking about that in 2 Thessalonians 1? Is Israel's avenger? Let me go back and read it. I see some confused faces here. I'm going to read it later on, but let me read it right now. Right now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I think section 3 fits 2 Thessalonians 1. He's coming as the avenger. It even says the word there, doesn't it? So section 3 in Psalms is about Christ coming as the avenger. Section 4, he comes as Israel's king. And section 5, he comes as Israel's blesser. Now I said to go to Psalm 78. Let me read you verses 1 through 5. Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parable, in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Why would he utter a parable? Do you remember what happened in Matthew? When did Christ stop speaking to the Pharisees? What chapter? Well, he goes for the first 12 chapters. That's 12 is the number for Israel. It's verse 13. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11, 13. 11 is the number of incompletion. 13 is our number because there's 13 epistles. Okay? So when did he stop speaking? Remember, it's called judicial blindness. Since you won't receive it, I'm going to give you what you want. Okay? He starts speaking parables in Matthew 13 just so the little flock could believe. He didn't, want, he didn't give them any more time. The other guys, they were destined for hell. So, I will open my mouth in parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done, he hath done, for he hath established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. They should make them known to the children. So, notice what God is doing with the nation of Israel. What is God's purpose in the nation of Israel? To establish a testimony, right? Israel is God's nation on the earth to be his representative. Now, the confusing thing to people that aren't dispensational is that he's not doing it today. He just sees lost and saved, not Jew and Gentile. Look at verse 6 and 7, also in Psalm 78. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which would be born, 
who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. What did we just find? What is the biggest, most important piece of information you can know about Israel? Could she keep the commandments? Can anybody keep them? So why do people want to go back there and change things around and think, well, I can do this and I can do that? I'm not trying to be nasty because they're ignorant of the truth. Okay? Paul says, let any man be ignorant. Let him be ignorant. He wants to be that way. If you want to, you know, in the dispensation of grace, God doesn't do the judicial blindness. He doesn't cut people off. We're still, his message is still for everybody today. You know, you know, um, but if you don't rightly divide, you won't get it. The last song I did on my, my t- tape, Do Ignorant Brethren Go to Heaven. And I did that. That's the song that should have ended the tape. And I had a, if you get saved, if you, at one point in your life, you get saved, you understand that Christ died for your sins. <clears throat> he shed his blood. He died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected. If you believe that in the privacy of your heart, you're saved and sealed. You're not going to go to hell. You're going to go to heaven. But people think, well, no, I can go out and do anything I want. That's not true. Because you read on in Romans, there's some things you would like to happen inside your body. And one of the things is understand Israel's program today. There isn't an Israel program today. There's just a Gentile program today, a dispensational program, the gospel of grace, not the gospel of the law, or the dispensation of grace. And that gives you the comfort, a confident and joyful expectation of a future certainty. That's what the world LP is, the hope. It's called E-L-P-I-S in Greek. Hope, a, future, a joyful and confident expectation of a future certainty. Sam was saying that. But if you don't want that, if you, if you think, you know, dispensational is a, is a nasty 12-letter word or something like that, you know, you think somebody's told you this without even bothering to look at it, you know, you under, understand it. That's why we're here, and that's why Paul did what he did for the rest of his life. Anywhere he was at, he gave the gospel. Even before his death, he was in jail. He said to go to Psalm 78, 6 and 7. Did I read this? Okay. So God had this purpose in Israel. He wants it passed on that the generations who come might know them. Even the children pass it on to each generation that they might set their hope in God. This is, that is the whole purpose. God wants every generation in Israel, when he was dealing with Israel exclusively, to understand why he created the nation and for what purpose. In order to do this, he is going to teach them a parable from Psalm 78, verse 7, that says, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Okay? And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation that set not, okay? Who can keep this? Somebody will, they'll take a look at verse, verse 7, but then you have verse 8. Their fathers couldn't keep it. What makes them think that their sons, their children can keep it? Does the apple fall far from the tree? Is that human nature? Does being a Jew make you any different? Can you, uh, can you keep it? Well, why do you think the last days of Israel is the most written about topic in the Bible? Because, I mean, I don't hate Jews. I don't hate the nation of Israel. I don't hate Gentiles. I don't like a lot of people on this earth that cause trouble, okay? But I don't hate them because they're not saved. I want them to get saved. So what's the problem? The world doesn't know. Who said it's, if you try doing something the same time over and over again, that you're an idiot? Try to, get, it's to try to get the same results of doing something over you're, you're an idiot. How many times can you read about Israel not being able to keep the commandments and failing the Lord, breaking the covenant? Disgusting things. Isn't that a clue? So you're going to take a verse out of context, you're going to plug it into your rhetoric, 
and you're going to make like you're some kind of holy weather, you know, what's that church you guys went to, Gene? Um, what's that guy's name? Armstrong. 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 He was, you know, a holy guy. Look at me. You know, do as I say, not as they do. You know, one of those type of guys. Because I'm telling you, that's what it really is when they're behind, when they're behind, at their homes. Do what I say, but not what I do. Okay? That's the bottom line to that. Remember, a parable is truth placed alongside truth to teach and instruct. Also remember, like I said earlier, Christ started teaching the little flock in parables in Matthew 13, 3, and you read about it in Isaiah 6, 10, you know, judicial blindness. Okay? We're in 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians, you see in chapter 2, God's going to send them strong delusion because they won't receive the truth. And the only thing that's letting, holding that back is the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace. When you come in there and try to put something else in there, you're screwing the whole thing. If you, if you had a, a, a gallon of water and you took some venom from a, from a cobra and put it in the water, are you going to feel good drinking that? Gonna, you might die, right? I, I don't know if it's that diluted. I don't know. But the point is, if you put a drop of venom in your cup of coffee, you're going to die. You might be able to mix it, but it doesn't take the poison out. And the poison, these people teaching the, the wrong truth, okay, that we're still under the law, we can still do these things that they couldn't do back in the Old Testament. Israel, the nation of God's creation, they couldn't do it. They failed just like everybody else done. Now that puts everything on a level. And that allows us to be kind, to be conscientious about people, to be, to be humble, because... The only true history book is this book right here, and it shows us up for what we are, okay? And I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. What does God from there on, what does he do from there on? He starts in Exodus 7. Now, that's when Moses comes to the Pharaoh, let my people go, right? And begins to account the history of Israel all the way through Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua and in Psalm 78, verse 7, 70, he says, He chose David also as his servant and took him from the sheep folds. He takes you all the way through the history of Israel over to 2 Samuel. When the Lord does, it, does this, he says, Do you see all these things that happened to Israel? Do you see these things? Do you see the information in Exodus? in Numbers, and Samuel, and in all those events, those events are parables. In other words, there is doctrine being communicated in the, event, in the events that took place in Israel's history. That's why I say, back here, the, you know, just a dress rehearsal, what's coming in the future? Because this time period right here, in the ages to come, we are not in this time period now, right now. We're in the dispensation of grace. You can't get saved in this time period by preaching the gospel of grace to them. Psalm 78, verse 24, it says, And had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. 25. Man did eat angels' food, and he sent them meat to the full. That was the quail. So the manna that he fed them with was really a parable of how he's going to use the nation of Israel. What happens is Israel is in the wilderness. This is in the wilderness. It's a type. Back up. What happens is Israel in the wilderness is a type, a picture of Israel in the wilderness in the last days. Okay. Because the, God, the things that God prom promised that they're going to own all the land and all the a kingdom of priests and nation of kings, that has not come to pass. Go to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea, to right after, right after Daniel, and let me read you verses 14 and 15. Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Talking about Israel, the adulterous wife to be restored, it says, 14, Therefore I will allure her, 
Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I will allure her. Remember, with these hearing aids, I can hear what you think. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Now that's future, right? And I will give her the vineyards from thence and the valley of Acre for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her, of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. The valley of Achor is Joshua 7. I'll get to that in a moment. When they judge the sin of Achan, Israel will enter her kingdom from the wilderness. Had Israel been in the wilderness before? Yes. The picture here will be again in the future. Now, before I get to the next part here, I want you to go back to Joshua chapter 6 and see what happened So I'm going to make a connection here. In Joshua chapter 6, now this has to do with the walls of Jericho when they first come into the land, you know, the trumpets and all that, and the walls falling down. Let me read Joshua chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. It says, And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. See that now? And Joshua saved Rahab, the heart of the alive, and her father's household and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, go to chapter 7. Let me just start reading down here, the 12. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, and the tribe of, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men. Well, I don't know if I want to go that far. Let me see here. Let's just drop down to verse 19. Achan is found out. He, he stole... Uh, a Babylonian garment and silver and gold and buried it in his tent in the sand. 19, and Joshua said unto Achan, My son, I give, I pray thee, glory to my Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Tell me what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord of God of Israel, and thus, and thus have I done. When I saw among the spells, the spoils, a goodly Babylonian garment, Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now 24 to 26. And Joshua and, Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the weight of the gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them in the fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones. Okay? Now, before this, Israel went to conquer Ai, and Ai got the Israels running. They didn't have God's protection. Joshua says, how come this is happening? Because somebody did something wrong when you went to Jericho. They kept these things. They kept the gold, and the, which should have gone to Israel's uh, treasury, not, not uh, individual. Now, it's these kind of stories, stories, ones written specifically to and about the nation of Israel, that empower Christians who do not study the Bible dispensationally. That's how legalism creeps in, setting yourself up as a judge, jury, and executioner. Give me your W-2. Give me your 1040. Let me know. Let's, I'm going to tie it off the gross. Give, you know, tithe in the store. Bring your tithes to the storehouse. Where are the storehouse? What is Satan's to plan? A is attack the messenger. B is attack the message. Okay? The ignorance of these people are the ones telling you to hand in your W-2 forms for tithing. Romans 130 says, 
backbiters, haters of God, despiteful boasters, inventors of evil things. Is it evil for somebody to take your W-2 and take 10% off the gross? Does God tell us to do that today? Okay. Who did he did it for? Who did he do it for? Who, what were, who were ties to? For Israel, right? Isn't that a nice piece of information to have? But this is how legalism keeps in. And I, I from my age, I have trouble handling it, but I do the best I can. I mean, I, I, I don't feel this way. I, I always feel like I don't know much. And that's just a feeling I have because I know how deep the wisdom is. I don't feel, you know, satisfied all the time. But, but I do come here because it is right to do. I enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it. I love all you people. And, and I think it's helping everybody. And, and I, you know, consider some of the other things I've done in my life. It's not a bad thing. So, and we're all sinners, you know. So I'm, I'm thankful, just like Sam said. Thankful. Um, Thank you. I think I heard that before you said it. <laughs> so the Valley of Bacor in Joshua 7, this picture will be here again in the future. Now to Jeremiah 30, 22 to 24. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth with forth with a fury, a continuing whirlwind, it shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, until he have performed the intents of his heart, and the latter days shall he consider it. This is the second coming of Christ, right? The fierce anger of the Lord. That is the time of the fierce anger of the Lord being poured out and the Lord coming in the whirlwind and the fury that that day when he comes with all those holy angels in flaming fire to take vengeance. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Why do you think I'm going all these places? You can only do this dispensationally because you can isolate these programs back here. And you can identify what we're in now we're talking about ages to come. So now we're moved over into the last days in what we call the tribulation time. Jeremiah 31, verses 1 and 2. At the same time, saith the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Now, some Moses is going to come along and say, dispensation of grace. No, that's not true, okay? In the wilderness, even Israel, and when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord gives rest to the people that believed in him. They will find grace in the wilderness. This is 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. What I'm trying to get you to see is the wilderness back here in Exodus and Numbers is a picture of the wilderness that Israel will be in in the tribulation. Here. Israel's history taught a parable, which is a dress rehearsal for the future. So in Revelation 12, you have a picture of some things that are going to happen to Israel in the last half of the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation starts in chapter 6 in Revelation. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his, his, his um, angels. Let me read you Revelation 12, 10 to 12. I'm almost done. Revelation 12, I just read you verse 7. 10 to 12 says, And now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe unto the, and the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. They come down to earth. 
Revelation 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Revelation 12, 5 is the man-child, the 144,000. I gave a, other verses there to look. Revelation 12, 6 is Israel, the woman, okay? Verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness on, into her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. That's three and a half years and three and a half years of the tribulation, Daniel. So in the last half of the tribulation, in the last half of the 70th week of Daniel, the time period that Jesus identified as the great tribulation is the intensification of that program. We are not in that program. Satan is cast out of heaven in the midst of the week. Where does Satan reside today? A lot of people, a lot of churches, right? And it's not physical, it's spiritual. He's cast out of heaven in the midst of the week. When he sees he is cast to the earth and that he has lost his authority in the heavens and the kingdom of God is established in the heavens, the only battlefield left is the earth. Three, so Satan begins to persecute, persecute the nation of Israel. They are his enemy because they are the testimony through whom God is going to accomplish his purpose in the earth. The more you know about Israel, the better ambassador you will be for the Lord. Thank you, Father, for these words. And as always, I just pray that um, the grace and just every, every, every time we speak, that just the glory and the, and the prophet just read down back to you. And I wish everybody would understand that and act accordingly. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.